Let's hear it for the world class NASA STEM Stars team. From NASA centers across the country, we present Tim Schwartz. Hi, NASA STEM Stars fans. My name is Taisha Batt, and I'm an education specialist here at Langley Research Center. Today we have with us Tim Schwartz from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Tim, how are you doing today? Good morning. Good afternoon. It's, uh, it's great to be here. I'm really excited to talk with the students today. And we're excited to have you here and to learn all of the amazing things that you are doing at NASA. So we're going to go ahead and jump right in and get started. So Tim, tell us a little bit about your childhood. Sure. So I grew up in New Jersey. This is a picture of little Timmy. Uh, I was a big New York Giants fan. And um, as I got older, I, I got into uh, fishing a little bit. Um, I enjoyed uh, spending time on the boat with, with my, my dad, my grandpa, um, and learn about how the boat worked and the motor and all that kind of stuff too. It was as much fun as fishing for me. And that's wonderful. I, I see that you already had that outdoor spirit with you, um, already fishing. And uh, well, I know you're a New York Giants fan, so that's great. I won't, I won't tell you who would team I support, but <laughs> we'll go with the New York Giants anyway. So <clears throat> I know that you enjoy being outside, and um, I also know that you like to hike a little bit and that there's a mm -hmm. picture of you um, scouting um, outside and doing a little hiking. So uh, talk to us about that. Sure, yeah. So the outdoors has has been and continues to be a, a big part of my life and this is a picture from my first backpacking trip with the boy scouts and uh, being a scout and being in the outdoors taught me so many things of course uh, you know be prepared is the scout motto and lessons about when you want to go into the outdoors what kinds of equipment to bring what kind of temperatures and weather you could be prepared for what kind of challenges you'll be faced with those are the same kind of ways of thinking and the same lessons that I think have helped me so much as an engineer, which we'll talk about later. That is amazing how all of that came together. And <clears throat> so since you were talking about scouting, um, mm -hmm. I know that you are actually an Eagle Scout. Um, right. And so talk to us a little bit about what goes into being an Eagle Scout and what lessons you learned there. A lot of hard work and a lot of planning. And uh, part of my time working towards my Eagle Scout rank was working on a big project where um, there was a, a museum at my church and it needed some renovations. So I had to you know, plan out a budget, plan out staffing, uh, make sure that we had all the materials that we needed to renovate this museum. And just thinking about um, you know, all the kind of showstoppers, right? What if what if we run out of the materials we need? What if we don't have enough snacks and, and people aren't happy working there? Things like that. Um, always trying to think about what if and, and being ready for any sort of challenge. Um, and so those were great lessons and also learning about leadership too and all the outdoor skills that went along with scouting as well. And that's great. It's amazing how you were able to put those skills together and that leadership and how that, you know, helps you out when you're at NASA. And so, Tim, I um, wanted to go back a little bit because um, you actually got to see a little bit of NASA when you were younger. So um, talk to us about a family trip that you actually went on. Um, at sure. NASA. So this was uh when I was a little kid, and, and that's my little brother Tyler standing next to me. This is a picture from Kennedy Space Center, and I was lucky enough to see a space shuttle on the launch pad, the shuttle Discovery. Didn't get to see it launch because the timing didn't work out, but um, I was I was hooked. I just thought that was the coolest thing. Uh, I got a souvenir mug, and I've had this as my pencil case 
uh, from, from that day that you saw on that picture all the way to now through college. Um, so I've just always been inspired by NASA. It's amazing that you still have that as a souvenir and that you are now working at NASA just to have that that background and then moving now is amazing to see that. And I also know that um, during high school, you also learned a lot from um, track and field. So talk a little bit mm -hmm. about your coach and, and, and what you learned when you were um, doing track and field. Yeah, so I was a sprinter and a hurdler and um, one thing that my, my coach really emphasized, you know, besides hard work and training was don't slow down before the finish line. Even if it was just a routine day of practice, he wanted to see us push hard all the way through the finish line. And that was a great lesson I learned too, because when you're working as an engineer, you, you can't slow down, you can't get lazy, you can't take shortcuts. You, you got to work through the finish line every time. And when you make that a good habit, then good things will follow. And it's amazing how you were able to to carry that on as well. I mean, even into your college years. And I know that you did actually a co-op when you were in college. So talk to our STEM fans of what a co-op is. They might not understand what that is and, and where you actually did your co-op. Sure, yeah. This is this is probably my number one piece of advice to give to students is look at the opportunities that your college or university has for internships and co-op programs. And so I was lucky enough to um, be accepted to work at JPL as a co-op student. So a co-op is um, usually like a longer internship, like a, a several month period of time where you really uh, get, to, get to learn the details of, of engineering. You get to meet lots of people you um, you can co-op far away from where you live, so it's a chance to uh, explore a new part of the country. This is my first time coming to California, was my co-op experience. And when I was there, I worked on the parts of the, the Curiosity rover, the previous one, that made it extend uh, forward and backwards. And so um, after having completed the co-op, I had all this great experience. I knew for sure that rovers were super cool. Here's a picture of uh, some JPL culture here with the rover crossing. And um, and I learned what it was like to, to do engineering besides what you just learned in the classroom, but, but get some, some practical skills and, and learn some more things. And who would have thought that you did that co-op at JPL and that you would be back at JPL actually working? That's amazing. And so um, I know that you did co-op while you were in college. And so talk to us, where did you end up in college? Um, mm -hmm. and, and why did you, you pick the college that you actually went to? So I went to Cornell University in upstate New York. And um, I, I picked it for, for some obvious reasons because it was uh, a good engineering university and um, it was sort of a negotiation between my parents. I wanted to go somewhere far and be on my own and they, they recommended, hey, why don't you stay a little closer? So four hours of a drive was, was the compromise, but I had a great time there. And after Cornell and after my co-op, I went to Stanford University. That was a picture that was just up on screen for my master's and PhD in aeronautics and astronautics. And while I was there, I did research on the temperatures that got created while you're drilling rock with a Mars rover drill. So I was still trying to point myself towards learning more and getting more experience about Mars and drilling and rover design. And uh, it, was, it was cool looking at a, a specific aspect of Mars missions that um, most people probably don't think about. So you talked about your major aeronautics and astronautics. And so can you kind of tell us what those are or how they differ from each other? Sure, yeah. So um, instead of just, uh, well, instead of studying mechanical engineering, I, I took that kind of focus on, you know, aerospace is what it's called sometimes. But uh, I took a lot of classes in how air flows over wings create lift and keep a plane in the sky and how the gas dynamics of uh, rockets combustion chamber and nozzles produce thrust 
And um, I think my favorite class of all is actually orbital mechanics. So why do planets and comets and spacecraft take the paths they do when they're you know, orbiting the sun or whether they're coming in for an approach to land somewhere? I uh, just really enjoyed the, the math and planning out those orbits and simulating them. And um, now I understand why it, why it takes the amount of time it takes to get to certain planets, especially the outer planets. That was really interesting to me. And, the, and that's great. And as you pursue those things, we, we actually have a question, um, okay. which is about what some advice would you give to students who are trying to pursue a career in STEM? So you've already you know, started pursuing that, but before you got to college, um, what would you tell a student who might be thinking about STEM? What could they do? Yeah, I would say, think about what questions you have and and realize that everything we see around us, computer chips and cars and musical instruments, all those things were, were designed by people. And there's probably ways to make them better. So if you're really fascinated about how something works and you want to know more, let that be your motivation to, to study it as you grow older. I remember when I was a kid, I watched Apollo 13 probably 400 times. And there's a, there's a scene where two parts of the spacecraft are are docking the command module and the lunar module. And I was just so fascinated. I had no idea what all the mechanics were there to, to have these two spacecraft link up. And once I learned that those, those questions are mechanical engineering questions, that, that had a lot to do with why I chose to study in school and learn more about mechanisms and spacecraft. That's great to you know tell students about you know pursuing your curiosity and, and going out there and, and going with it. That's a, a major thing. So I, I was talking to you a little earlier and I saw that you had this beautiful easel in the back and you told me that, um, that your wife was the artist. And so um, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about the next picture that you have of you two together. Yeah. Um... I met my wife while I was at Stanford and uh, we got married after I graduated. And um, my wife's name is Claire and uh, she's a wonderful artist and uh, she's inspiring to me with the, the landscapes and um, particularly the, the fashion illustrations that she does. Yeah, that's amazing that, you know, I think we were talking and I think I missed the artistic gene, but it's amazing when you have someone who has that creative spirit with you, you know, you complement each other. And so you also have a picture of your, your best friend here. So tell us a little <laughs> bit about uh, you and your best friend. Yeah, this is Skywalker and uh, he's great. Um, He's, he's really funny and he wakes up in the morning. That's I don't need an alarm clock anymore because as soon as the sun comes out, he starts uh, he starts making noises kind of like a wolf, ooh, you know, when he wants to eat. So he's a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I can tell. I have I have some no, noise makers in my in my household as well. <laughs> and so um, you also have a lot of other interests. I know that one of your interests is that you, you like to climb. So talk a little bit about um, that picture and, and where you were at actually. Sure, yeah. So I, I mentioned earlier that hiking and camping was a big part of my life early on and, and I still continue to try to climb higher. This is uh, on the top of a mountain, actually a volcano in Northern California named Mount Shasta. And to climb a mountain like this, you need a lot of specialized equipment and skills. You have to be confident climbing up ice and snow and, and steep slopes and know how to use ropes and, um, you know, wear a helmet is a good idea for, for many outdoor hobbies. Um, and so uh, that's, that's what I love to do when I have time. And, um, you know, just getting to see new mountains, new points of view, going higher, I find that really fulfilling. And I can see that that's fulfilling for you. Um, I can only imagine um, what it's like to, to hike up that kind of a mountain. Um, but I also know that you have another um, love of yours and, and you mm -hmm. talked a little bit about it. So kind of tell us why it is that you know you like F1, um, NASCAR racing. So talk a little bit about that and what inspires you with that. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I grew up a big football fan, but once I discovered motor racing, uh, that, that really just took over as my favorite sport. So this is myself in front of a uh, Formula One race in, in Austin, Texas. Maybe some of the listeners know about Circuit of the Americas. And one thing that I find so interesting about motorsports, especially Formula One, is that it's, it's not just a competition of the drivers on the track, but the, there's a whole team of engineers behind the scenes who are competing with the lab work they do, with the uh, wind tunnel work they do, all the computer modeling, many of the same skills and tools that we use at NASA. And, uh, and it, it just makes watching the race that much more fun to know, you know which drivers have the most high tech wings and engines and, and things like that. That's, that's a sport for an engineer for sure. And we actually have a couple of questions. One question, sure. um, our listener wanted to know, do you race yourself? Um, so that's the first question, do you race? I have a little bit of go-kart experience, but, but that's it. I've never been on a, you know, a real track in a real car. Um, I love to, but uh, I guess I just play video games of that for now. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand that. And then the second question is, how have your hobbies or interests um, helped you in your career in NASA? Yeah, so I think that building a rover is like packing for the ultimate camping trip. You have dust swirling in the air. You have temperatures that go far colder than anything on Earth in the Antarctic. You have a, a different amount of gravity, so many, so many challenges, and, and you really have to try to think in advance of, of everything that could, you know, go wrong and prepare for that and, and, and engineer and build a solution to it. Uh, just like you would when you're packing for a mountaineering trip, you know, if you forget, uh, if you forget your ice axe, uh, you could find yourself in a really dangerous situation. So you have to be really detailed. And, um, you know, it kind of reminds me of a, of a quote, probably my favorite quote. Uh, this is something we say at, at JPL and amongst the sampling engineers is, if we knew everything there was to know, we wouldn't have to go there, which, what does that mean? That sounds like a strange quote. And what it means is we don't design rovers to explore our backyards or our streets or, you know, our kitchens. We send rovers to go places where no one's been before. And so that means you really have to think of everything in advance and, and try to plan for it. Uh, you know, have a rover that it can get itself out of tricky situations. And so that's something to keep in mind while you're designing and engineering and testing it. But that quote also means, if we knew it all, we wouldn't have to go there. It means that you're going to encounter some unexpected challenges. There's going to be, quite, quite literally, from a rover point of view, there's going to be bumps in the road. And rather than letting those those events scare you just trust that you've engineered the best piece of machinery that that can be engineered and then find a way to use what's there to get around the obstacles and that's an important thing that sometimes you know you get to places that might scare you whether uh, it's a career or a class in school but you just have to go through those obstacles and and know that you'll persevere um, and make it out. So that's a wonderful thing. Um, and so STEM fans, we are getting ready to do our new segment that we have in NASA STEM stars called Lightning Round. I am going to ask Tim some rapid fire questions and he's going to give me okay. some one word responses. So Tim, are you ready? I'm ready. Let's do this. Time for NASA STEM STARS Lightning Round. All right, Tim, we are kind of competitive here at NASA STEM STARS. So if we bring up that leaderboard, we'll see that um, we got someone who has 10 questions correct. So we're going to try to at least get 10 questions. So put 30 seconds on that clock for us. Passenger or driver? Driver. Early bird or night owl? Early bird. Talker or texter? Texter. Pen or pencil? Pencil. 
dine-in or delivery? Dine-in. Pizza or pickles? Pizza. Introvert or extrovert? Extrovert. Oh, we got seven questions. Oh, ask. no. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's okay. I mean, there we have to think about those questions. So we did really well. So congratulations, you got seven questions. So you said that in one of your questions, you said extrovert. So how yeah. does being extroverted help you in your career in NASA? Sure. Well, um, you know, it's, it's not to say that introverts can't be amazingly successful as an engineer or in a STEM field. Um, I don't want to give the wrong impression, but um, being comfortable asking questions and asking for help does really help me as an engineer, because if if everybody at JPL, all five or six thousand of us were spending time reinventing the wheel, we wouldn't get much done. So you really have to rely on reaching out to experts, being upfront about questions and challenges you have. And then I find it super fun when people ask me questions and I'm able to help and I'd say, oh yeah, you know, I, I solved a problem just like that. Why don't you think of it this way? Why don't you take a look at this presentation? So I really like that community aspect. But again, um, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, uh, everyone can be successful and a good communicator. And that is wonderful because some people are introverted and some people are extroverted, but it doesn't matter. You can still do the things that you want to do. And so actually we have a student question, which is going to lead us to our next um, picture that you have. And it is from Stephanie who wants to know, how do you make a rover? So that's a kind of open question, but you can kind of tell us what you are doing in that first picture of you, I think, in the bunny suit. Sure. So uh, this this picture of myself in a bunny suit, um, which you see in a moment, is actually four or five or maybe six years after I started working on the Perseverance rover. So when I started in 2014, we had a lot of questions to ask, like, I mean, just basic fundamental stuff. How many arms is this rover going to have? Is it going to use the same arm to reach out and get samples and cap the cap the sample tubes where the rock cores go and all this stuff. We had all these questions. So just a lot of block diagrams and arrows and slides and you know presentations, things like that. Once that gets figured out, then you start to get to the real, you know, the nuts and bolts design, you know, including nuts and bolts in your design and all the details of the, the different mechanical pieces and what kind of motor is going to be connected to the mechanisms you're working on. And, and that takes a long time. There's a lot to think about. And then you take each individual part that you've designed and then you create a blueprint for it. And then those uh, parts that you've specified come back and then they get assembled in the clean room. And, you know, of course we wear the, the bunny suit uh, to keep hair and, and dust and other uh, earth contaminants away from our very clean spacecraft, especially uh, one where, you know, we want to learn about the rocks and, and the habitable environments of Mars and we don't want any any, uh, you know, biological matter from, from humans contaminating our science results. So what you see here is a, a picture of myself with a transmission that's on the rover. It's a transmission for the drill. And so the drill needs to spin fast to uh, the drill into the rock, but then it needs to drill or it needs to rotate more slowly, but with more rotational force. We call that torque in engineering. It needs to provide more torque in order to snap off the rock cores. And so what a transmission does is it allows you to exchange speed. Uh, you, get, you can give up some speed and then gain more torque or vice versa. And that was the right, right tool for that job. And now that it's launched in on Mars, I've moved into a mission operations role where I help plan the activities for the rover, particularly for the sampling and caching system of the rover. And so now, um, Basically, we're, we're beaming up code and instructions for the rover to do. And that's amazing. I just I can't even imagine going from where you started to actually seeing your rover on Mars. Um, so I'm giving away a little picture before then. But mm -hmm. um, so I, we do have a close up of um, the drill 
with uh, everything in. So let's talk about what we see in this picture. Yeah, so this is the completed drill during some final checkouts just days before it got mounted onto the robotic arm. And the, the drill has five different motors on it. It's got a spindle to rotate the drill bit. It's got a percussion system. It's got a chuck that can exchange different types of drill bits. It's got a feed system so it can push the drill into the rock as it drills the hole. And then a core breakoff system, which interacts with spindle. It's really interesting. And then here's the whole completed uh, drill on the robotic arm. And it's it's hard to even find in there because there's so much going on in that picture. But it's it's kind of right in the middle, up top a little bit. There's a there's a piece of aluminum foil over the the drill bit there just to keep it clean. Even though it's already in a very clean space, we just go that extra mile. And so it wasn't much longer after that picture before it got uh, put inside a capsule, put on top of a rocket, and then all my hard work had to say bye. But I think probably the the proudest moment of my career so far was starting to see these pictures coming back with that same drill that I spent all those years working on now with the most incredible background I can imagine. Um, makes me so happy that it's there and uh, it's got a lot of work to do. So it's a really exciting time for the Perseverance mission. And I think you answered our question. Uh, we had a question from a student who said, what is your favorite memory um, at NASA. And so I think you kind of talked about your favorite memory of seeing that. But we also have a few other questions from students that we okay. wanted to ask. So one student wanted to know, where were you watching when Perseverance landed on Mars? Um, where were you my watching? neighbor, yeah, my, my neighbor who uh, also worked on the mission had a, had a uh, projector screen set up in the front yard and so i went with my wife and um we had to stay pretty socially distant but we all we all watched uh, the projector screen uh the same news feed that you would see um you know wherever you were watching it from but it was it was really fun and it was neat to be there with other people who had worked on the mission because we all had a a very small role to play but when you all add, you know you add up all those small contributions that's what it takes to to get a rover and, and something so interesting like that. And we still have uh, more questions. I'm going to combine a couple of them together. Um, but Shuri wanted to know what made you want to work at NASA and get into the space field? And also, what is Megatronics? <laughs> so those are kind of meshed together questions. OK, so NASA. You know, I just, I would just always was so fascinated by aircraft and, and spacecraft. I pretty much knew my whole life that I wanted to work with NASA to either be an engineer or an astronaut. I'm, I'm applying for that. Um, thought I might want to be a pilot for a little while, but, uh, but engineering has, has been great. And just, just wondering, you know, how things work. And um, when I was younger, I, I took an astronomy class with my dad and my brother. And so once a week, we would go out and look through telescopes with the instructor and just learned a ton of stuff. There's just so many neat questions out there in space. And then I, I mentioned the role that outdoors plays in my life, too. So, you know, I want to explore. I want to see new places. Why not work on a project where we send a, a robot 140 million miles away and see what we find there? Um, and then, yeah, I work on mechatronics, so that's that's a combination of mechanical engineering and electrical engineering. You put them together, and you get to work on things like mechanisms with, you know, motors and transmissions and sensors. Um, it, so, you know, typically work on smaller things, not not you know big pieces of structural equipment, but but tiny little mechanisms. Um, so that's that's what a mechatronics engineer does. And that's amazing um, that you get to combine those things together in Megatronics. And so we want to get the students involved in actually doing something with the students. So we have a call of action to the students. Um, students, you can also get your own core sample. So what you're going to do is you're going to make your own core sample and drill kind of like the drill that we have on Mars. And we hope to see all of the things that you do at hashtag NextGenStem. 
And we still look forward to you seeing us again next week. So we want to talk to you about who our next STEM star is. And next STEM star we have is Kurt Lloyd. And so he is a NASA software developer, and he will be here next Wednesday at 2 o'clock. Don't forget to subscribe so that you'll know about all of our events. And before we leave, we want Tim to, to give some final words to the students or some final advice that you would um, give them if they're thinking about pursuing STEM or, or any career. So Tim, what would you like to say for our students? I would say ask big questions and let those guide you. And, and remember, if, if we knew it all, we wouldn't have to go there. So think about places where there are still things left to learn and go after that. And those are great words. And we thank you, Tim, for joining us. And we thank you, STEM Star fans, for being with us. So have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody.